Here's the struggle. Okay, I know nobody cares about this but me, but I'm gonna talk about it anyways. This lighting is really difficult to work with. <laughs> Poor me. So I'm doing my best. I know you guys really like this live background and I do too, but it's really difficult to manage like the lighting and the white balance and all of that stuff. So I'm, I'm struggling. And by the time I figure it out, we're gonna have moved, so. <laughs> also, we're no closer to finding a place to live, so not stressed at all. <laughs> okay, all right, nobody cares. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Trime. Crew Trime. Crew Trime. If you are new here, hi, I'm Sarah. How did you find me? Let me know in the comments. What I do here is I tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and I put on my makeup at the same time. So if you are into weird combinations like that, then you are in the right place. So you should go ahead and subscribe to this channel, hit the bell notification, and then that way you will never miss another one of my weird uploads. Also, if you want to recommend a crew crime story to me so I can cover it on this channel, there is a new, newish in the last couple of weeks. There's a Google doc down in the description box. You just fill that out. I get all the information. Thank you so much. Today's story was recommended via email from a viewer named Alma Lucille. Hi Alma, thank you so much. Alma also told me that she was working on making a YouTube channel of her own. So if you're watching Alma, did you do it yet, girl? Because if you did, let me know in the comments and I'll pin it right here and then we can all go check it out. So we are still working on covering terrible stories from every state in the union. So let's see where we're going. Today's terrible story comes from the only state where it is illegal to take a bath between the months of October and March. You gotta love these weird laws that like nobody cares about, but nobody also bothered to like overturn. <laughs> the state with the world's largest ball of paint, the Hoosier state. Not Louisiana, Paris, France, New York, or Rome. And the home of the Indianapolis 500, can't forget that. This is Indiana, and this is the story of Herbert Baumeister. So even though I've never heard of this story before, it has been covered a lot in all the TV shows that you and I love the most and also podcasts, including My Favorite Murder and Crime Junkies, two of my favorites. I'm gonna go ahead and link them down below so you can learn more or if you just like never wanna sleep again because the story is crazy. The last crew crime story was so long that I ran out of makeup. So we're gonna do all the skincare and stuff on camera. Isn't that nice? Also, I don't really talk about the products that I'm using, but they are all linked down below if you're interested. Herbert Richard Baumeister was born on April 7th, 1947 to Elizabeth and Herbert Baumeister Sr. in Washington Township, very fancy area of Indianapolis, Indiana. So Herbert Herb was the oldest of four children. He had three younger siblings. So Herb grew up in a very affluent situation. His father was a doctor and his mother stayed home to raise the kids. As he grew a little bit older, you know, into adolescent, like tween years, he started to change. Old Herbie, was he ever called Herbie? I don't know. Herb was known to play with dead animals and not just play with them. You know, he would pick up a dead bird, put it in his pocket and like walk around for a while. Very weird. He once left a dead crow on his teacher's desk, like as a present? I mean, is he a cat? Drop it! <laughs> Herb was also very interested in the flavor of human urine. Well, Herb had no problem sharing these thoughts with like anybody that would listen. One time he peed on his teacher's desk. Basically, he had just become like obsessed with disgusting things, you know. His judgment was skewed. He was disruptive and volatile and like a general creep. His peers and pretty much everybody around him thought he was weird, man. He's weird. He's into like dead animals and pee. So Herb's father, Dr. Baumeister, took him to be evaluated mentally. Herbert Jr. was diagnosed with 
schizophrenia and also as having multiple personality disorder, but he was never treated for it because the, remember, this was like the 1960s. It's just the beginning of large-scale drug trials for antipsychotic medicines. And even though Herb's father was a physician, he didn't feel comfortable with letting his son, you know, participate in a drug trial. So long story longer, Herb wasn't treated at all. And you know what, to be fair, drug trials and any kind of treatment for schizophrenia or anything along those lines was low-key, high-key barbaric. It was very common for people to just get locked away in a mental institution or be treated with electric shock and electroconvulsive therapy. It's not good. And as I mentioned earlier, behavior therapy came much later. So when people today talk about Herbert and say that his parents should have treated his mental illness, I mean, of course they should have, but that wasn't really a thing back then. Okay, so Herbert attended North Central High School in Indianapolis, and he had a couple of friends, but he wasn't super social. He was definitely not like a popular kid, although he he wanted to be, he was aware of this, but they, they weren't having it. You can't sit with us. In high school, he did not date or have any romantic relationships. After graduating from high school in 1965, he went to Indiana University to study anatomy and biology. He had originally intended to kind of follow in his father's footsteps and become a doctor as well, a physician. While he was studying at IU, he joined the Young Republicans, and this is where he met Juliana Julie Sater, a high school teacher and part-time student at Indiana University. After one semester, college life just wasn't working out and Herb dropped out. He later briefly returned at his, you know, father's encouragement. He also briefly attended Butler University, but that didn't last long either. And then he ended up moving back home. Once he was back home, his father helped him get a job as a copy boy, which is like, like an errand boy at the local newspaper the Indianapolis Star. So in 1971, Herb was about 24 years old. He and Julie got married. Within six months of the wedding, very much still in the honeymoon phase, Julie reached out to Herb's father because Herb Jr. was struggling mentally and he needed some help. So Dr. Baumeister arranged for Herb to undergo inpatient treatment for two months, which is like the very, very polite way of saying that he had him committed. While he was there undergoing treatment, he was diagnosed as having obsessive compulsive disorder. Julie didn't actually find that out until many years later. After Herb was released from treatment, he later went to work for the Indiana Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Things at home settled down and they were good. You know, about nine years later, he and Julie decided to start growing their family and over the coming years, they welcomed two girls and a boy by 1984 or so. Herb was described as a great father, you know, kind and loving and very involved with family life. Okay, so Herb at home and Herb at work were two very different people. Remember, he was working for the Indiana BMV, so like from 1974 to like 1985 or so. I mean, it was all good. He was good at his job. He eventually promoted to program director and he had a good work ethic and all that stuff. But his coworkers said that he was like just weird. He did weird things. One report said that he Herb kept a cake in his filing cabinet for years just to like watch it deteriorate. Another coworker said that Herb kept a dead cat in a bag in his filing cabinet, but why though? That's just Herb. Well, I guess all this weird stuff just started to add up and finally somebody called HR. He had actually recently been suspected of peeing on the boss's desk. He also definitely peed on a letter that was meant to be sent to the governor. I'm gonna piss on it. What's with all the peeing? I don't know. Herb lost his job. So after he was fired, he did stay at home with the kids for a time. Julie had gone back to work. She had previously been, you know, a journalism teacher. This worked well for them, but you know, Herb was still having mental issues and he had started self-medicating with alcohol. He was also struggling with his sexuality. So 
Although Herb was married to Julie, a woman, he was sexually attracted to men. And you know, we see this a lot, especially in like older cases. That's what society expects. You're a man, you marry a woman, whatever, whatever. Julie actually later said that she and Herb had only had sex six times in the 25 years that they spent together. Six times. And they had three kids. So three of those times were very productive. So as time went on, Herb began venturing out. You know, he would visit local gay bars and he had a bad habit of driving drunk. In 1985, he was arrested for aggravated DUI and he hit a pedestrian with his car. All DUIs are classified as aggravated and that makes them a felony. But you know, good old Herb just got a warning and they let him go. About six months later, he was arrested for grand theft auto after he got drunk and stole his friend's car and drove drove away, but again, given a warning and let go. I wonder what's gonna happen. Okay, so now it's like the late 80s, you know, 1987, 1988 or so. Herb got a job at a local thrift store and he enjoyed it so much that he and Julie ended up opening two of their own stores and they named them Save-A-Lot. Not the grocery store, the thrift store, okay? Don't confuse. Their stores were actually very successful and they were, financially stable, finally, after all these years. After her bouncing from job to job, they were able to buy their forever family home and they purchased Fox Hollow Farm for about $1 million. And this was in 1991. So in today money, that would be like just over $2 million. The property was 18 acres of land and the house was like 11,000 square feet. So this was like a proper mansion. If you live in a house that's 11,000 square feet and you don't think it's a mansion, good for you. Anyways, so Herb was well known and well respected in Hamilton County. He was known as a successful business owner and a family man. Later, Julie said that she and the children in the summertime would often, or like not often, every summer, they would go to their property on the lake, Lake Wawasee. Herb would stay behind and take care of the business. In fact, starting in 1989, Herb had business trips that would take him down Interstate 70 multiple times during the summer, and this continued every year. So Herb had the summers to himself. So fast forward to July, 1993. So a private investigator named Virgil Vandegrift, who was a retired detective from the Marion County Sheriff's Department, he was contacted by the family of 32 year old Roger Goodlett. So Roger had left his home for the night and never returned. Roger's mom had contacted his friends, you know, Roger's friends and his brother and nobody had seen him and they knew all of the places that he normally would go. Well, Roger's mother contacted the police and explained the situation and they told her they would have to wait 48 hours to like file an official report. We've been through this. It's not true. Anyways, so she let that time pass and then she called them back to make the report and then they told her that they would have to wait 30 days before they could do an official investigation. What? Roger's family, of course, refused to wait that long, so they contacted this private investigator. Well, Virgil started looking into Roger's disappearance, of course, and before he could even really get started, he got another phone call. This time, it was from the family of another missing man named Alan Brousard. So Virgil quickly noticed how similar these stories were. The men were physically similar, clean cut, preppy, you know, they had similar jobs, they frequented the same night spots, but in 1993, active tracking, like cell phone triangulation and all of that stuff that we use now, just like wasn't really a thing. Also, neither of these guys had credit cards, so tracking them down was gonna be really difficult. So Virgil used what he could and he made wanted posters, like m missing posters. And he took those posters and hung them up in the nightclubs and bars that he knew that these two guys used to go to. Now, Virgil and his little team of investigators, they also talked to the owners of the bars, trying to get tips about these missing guys, but you know, some witnesses say that they saw him get into a blue car that had Ohio license plates. Through Virgil's investigation, he realized that eight other men had gone missing in the city in like the last two years. And this 
of course included Roger and Alan. All of the missing men had last been seen in bars. They were of similar age, similar like preppy vibes. You know, it was like the style. Also, if you haven't connected the dots yet, these were these were gay men and these were gay bars. You know, it's 1993, it's the Midwest and police aren't like in a super hurry to help people that they didn't like. And you know what? I didn't even really want to mention this point, you know, that these men were gay because because first of all, who cares? Also, being gay should not increase your risk of like disappearing. But unfortunately, this issue is kind of central to this case because the police pretty much refused to help because of it. I mean, they eventually did, but there wasn't a lot of urgency. So three months later, Virgil was contacted by an anonymous source regarding an encounter that he had had with a man that he was sure was responsible for all of this. The man said that he had struck up a conversation with a man at a bar that he had met that introduced himself as Brian Smart. Spoiler alert, Brian Smart is Herbert Baumeister. Mm -hmm. So this guy, the caller, noticed this man, Herbert, in the bar, like really, really looking at these missing posters for these missing men. They struck up a conversation, they enjoyed a drink together. The guy said that Brian was perfectly charming and enjoyable and invited him to come back with him to a house to go swimming. So this guy said that he rode in the car, Brian's car, as he drove. They drove way out to the country, like to the middle of nowhere. So Herb said that he lived in Ohio and he was the caretaker of this estate. So they drove and drove and then they get there and it's like a long winding driveway. When they got to the house and went inside where the pool was, oh yeah, it was an indoor pool. All around the pool area were mannequins. Mannequins. Mannequins dressed up like they were having a party. So he asked Herb, what's up with all the mannequins, guy? And Herb said that the owner of the house just like didn't like to be alone. You guys have seen I Am Legend, right? Where Will Smith has all these mannequins staged about so he has somebody to talk to. Hey, who's the girl? Uh, never mind. Hey, I'll see you in the morning. How pitiful. The guys are inside. They're having a good time. They're drinking more alcohol and then... They also enjoyed some whitey stuff. Whitey stuff is cocaine. I would say. Yep, mm hmm the whitey stuff. And then they got into the pool. So Herb asked this guy to choke him while he handled himself. And he produced like a length of hose, like rubber hose. So the guy was curious and he was like, okay. And they went at it, you know, bing, bang, boom. Herb does what he does and then when he was finished he was like okay it's your turn i'm gonna choke you now okay anyway so they get to it and the guy pretty quickly realizes that herb's not gonna stop choking him until he like you know passes out so he pretends to pass out well then he you know pretends to like wake back up and herb was very startled by this and he like started scrambling around, rushing to like get himself dressed and he wanted to get out of there. And they did. So they got in the car and Herb drove him back to the bar that he had picked him up from awkwardly, silently and dropped him off. So Virgil in his investigation is kind of comparing this guy and his physical attributes to the young men that had gone missing. This man that he was talking to on the phone is anonymous, whatever his name is. He was quite tall. Herb probably couldn't handle him, you know, otherwise. Okay, so now with this story of this encounter and the description of the house, Virgil spent the next year looking for Brian Smart. He was also looking for this estate, this farmhouse, and he was looking mostly in Ohio because of the Ohio license plates. Now, poking around inside Ohio would eventually change everything. He discovered that Ohio had an investigation ongoing about dead bodies, men that were from Indiana being found in Ohio along Interstate 70. Interstate 70, if you're not catching on, runs through Ohio and Indiana. So police in Ohio were finding men, gay men, all from Indianapolis, all strangled, and all left on the side of the road of I-70. And it had been happening since like the 80s. Okay, so when investigators learned about all those bodies in Ohio that all kind of matched the same scenario as what was going on in Indiana, they were able to call on the FBI because once it crosses state lines, it becomes federal. The FBI was able to construct a profile of the suspect 
they said that this man, this perpetrator, was definitely in like his 40s or so. And he had probably been at these kinds of activities since he was in his 20s. He was probably very frustrated with the fact that he's homosexual but married to a woman. I mean, that's a pretty good profile. They named this suspect the I-70 Strangler. So let's talk about the victims. Okay, so the news coverage at the time of these victims was, by today's standards, pretty obscene. But in the 90s, you know, it was par for the course when they were talking about gay men. Of course, they're highlighting that it's risky behavior, that they're into drugs, blah, 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 blah. So these men, and you know, to be honest, some of these are actually boys because they're very young. These men were typically engaged for some kind of sexual encounter, whether it be recreational or professional. They were all strangled and left on the side of the road like trash. Similar to to some of the other cases that I've covered. There's a lot of victims in these cases and I can't get into all of the details for all of them because there's so many, but I do wanna make sure that they are all acknowledged. On June 16th, 1980, 15 year old Michael Petrie was discovered naked and strangled in a rural area in Hamilton County, Indiana. In July, 1982, 23 year old Maurice Taylor was found strangled in Weasel Creek in Hamilton County, Indiana. In October, 1982, 14 year old, yeah, that's right, eighth grader Delvoy Lee Baker was found strangled and semi nude near a river in Hamilton County. In June 1983, 22 year old Michael Andrew Riley was found nude and strangled in a ditch in Hancock County, Indiana. In May of 1985, 17 year old Eric Allen Rotger was found strangled in Prable County, Ohio. In August of 1986, 29-year-old Michael Allen Glenn was found in a ditch near Eaton, Ohio. He had been strangled. In October of 1987, 21-year-old James Robbins was found strangled in a ditch in Shelby County, Indiana. In May of 1989, Jean-Paul Talbot was found strangled and dumped near a stream in Defiance County, Ohio. In August of 1989, 26-year-old Stephen Elliott was found strangled with a rope they think, in Prable County, Ohio. In August of 1990, 32-year-old Clay Russell Boatman was strangled and left in a ditch in Eaton, Ohio. In August 1990, 18-year-old Thomas Clevenger Jr. and Otto Gary Becker were both found dead. Neither were strangled, so they weren't technically attributed to the I-70 Strangler, but maybe. Okay, so back to the private investigator, Virgil. He had been searching for this Brian Smart for like over a year, and he had found pretty much nothing but more bodies. That is until August of 1995. So the same anonymous caller, the guy who had narrowly escaped from being strangled in a pool the year before, he was out and about, you know, at the bar, and who walked in? Brian Smart. Well, he saw him and he remembered that Brian drew drove a blue car with Ohio license plates. So he went outside to, you know, get the number. Then he called Virgil and the plate didn't match anybody named Brian Smart, but it did match Herbert Baumeister. We know who he is, but like he's viewed as like a respected businessman in the community and a family guy and all of these things. So police didn't have enough evidence to issue a search warrant, but they went to go talk to Herb at work. They asked Herb if he knew any of the missing men, if he's been to the gay bars, has he met these men? He denied everything, of course. Well, they asked him for permission to search his property, you know, just to clear his name. And he was like, uh, no. But you know, without any more evidence, they couldn't do anything. So now with the police squinting at him, Herb, over the next six months, really started to crack. Like, full meltdown. He was getting into screaming matches with the neighbors. He was drinking a lot. Also, the estate, the grounds and the buildings and everything was just falling into disrepair. They had stopped doing any kind of maintenance at all. Business at the stores was like really taking a nosedive and that, you know, affected their bottom line. They ended up having to file for bankruptcy. The Baumeister's West Washington Street store is closed and there's now a for sale sign in front of the property. Now employees say they're still waiting to be paid. 
He called all of the employees and told us to meet him in the parking lot here at 5 o'clock on Friday to pick up our checks. And when we all showed up, we waited around till 6 to 6.30 and he never showed up. Those same employees say Baumeister's behavior at the store was erratic. He was jumpy. He was a nervous man. He was a very nervous man. In November of 1995, one day Herb was out away from the store, like out on a delivery, and the police went to go talk to Julie. They told her that Herb was a suspect in these homosexual homicides. She had no idea what that is. Neither do I, Julie. Anyways, okay, so the police explained that Herb's car had been seen at these gay bars, gay men were missing, and bodies were popping up in Ohio. And they believed that Herb was the person who killed them. Julie was like, uh, I don't think so. That's weird. And they were asking for her permission to come out and search the property. And she was like, uh, no. Julie knew down deep inside that she needed to leave Herb. Their questions really kind of got her thinking about the state of their marriage and something very alarming from about two years before. Hi friends, editing Sarah. I, I see the lash. I see it hanging off. I see it. So her son Eric had been playing out in the woods of their property when he found a skull. Well, he brought the skull to her and then he took her out to the woods to show her where he found it. There were bones on the ground, like just right there with the leaves. It looked like, according to her, she said that it looked like somebody had just laid down and died. Well, when Herb got home, she asked him about it and he told her that, oh no, 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 no. That's just an anatomical skeleton from his dad's medical practice. She explained that Herb was kind of a pack rat. You know, he kept a lot of things and he told her that the raccoons from the property must have gotten inside the garage and like carried it away. Raccoons, Herb. Anyway, after that conversation with Herb, she later went out to look in that area and all the bones were gone. Very, very interesting. By January of 1996, divorce proceedings had begun. Herb was drinking a lot. Like I said, Julie and the kids were living at the farm and Herb was camped out at the lake house. Her relationship with Herb had deteriorated so much and he was acting super erratic, disappearing for long periods of time. Also, the police were really hounding her a lot. And one day she finally relented. She let them come out and take a look around. So when detectives came out to search the property, she told them about that skeleton in the woods. She took them out to the spot where she had found it. And this is crazy. While they're standing there, one of the investigators just looked down and picked up a bone. Well, you know, Julie had this just intense love for Herb. You know, they'd been together for such a long time. He was the father of their three children. She could never imagine that he would be capable of such a thing. When they found the bones, she cooperated completely. The detectives were then able to get a search warrant for Fox Hollow Farm, and Julie worried what Herb would do when he found out. Well, despite all this, Hamilton County would not sign an arrest warrant for him. They didn't even put him under surveillance. I mean, it's entirely possible that Hamilton County did not want to believe that an upstanding affluent man in their county was a serial killer. Julie's lawyer finally did get an order for their son to be removed from Herb's custody. The son was out at the lake house with Herb and he also issued a protective order for Julie and the children. So an entire like recovery crew with a like a backhoe, dug up the yard, the grounds there at Fox Hollow, and they found so many bones, like 5,000 bones. Apparently, Herb really liked to put bodies in his mulch pile. He also had small rocks and pebbles that lined the driveway, but they weren't rocks and pebbles. No, no, no. These were bones that had been pummeled. And still, Still, Hamilton County would not arrest him. As a matter of fact, the Hamilton County Sergeant Ken Wisman received a call on June 30th, 1996 from Herb's brother. So he told him that Herb, his brother, had called him and asked him to wire him money to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan 
right near the Canadian border. Well, he wanted police to know that Herb was on the run, probably about to jump the border. Still, they did nothing. In fact, when he asked why he had still not arrested Herb, Wisman said, we don't have enough evidence to prove that Mr. Baumeister had killed anyone. How many bones do you need? Just asking. On July 4th, 1996, that same Sergeant, Sergeant Wisman got another call from Herb's brother. This time it was to notify him that Herb had committed suicide. So Herb had driven north out of Indiana, past Detroit, and then crossed into Ontario, Canada. So he followed along the coast of Lake Huron, parks and wooded areas and such. He had pulled his car over at some point to like sleep, I guess, and a Canadian mounted police officer approached and said, you can't, you can't sleep here. She took his license and registration, ran it in the system. There was no alerts, no problems. She did notice that the backseat of his car was filled with videotapes though. Weird. Well, sometime after that, on July 3rd, 1996, Herb Baumeister parked his car and then took a handgun, aimed it at his forehead and pulled the trigger. He did leave a three page note, but nothing in the note admitted guilt to anything. There was no confession to any of the murders. It really just talked about his like failed business and marriage problems and all that stuff. He did not mention at all, all the bones in the backyard. Also, when they discovered his body, the vehicle, no videotapes. What did he do with all of them? I have to return some videotapes. Anyways, so back to Fox Hollow Farm. The forensic anthropologist estimated that the bones that they discovered were from at least 11 men, but only eight of the victims could be positively identified. Julie was actually instrumental in helping the investigators of Ohio by providing receipts from Herb's travels that proved that he had transited up and down I-70 during these times. So the timeline really matched up, right? Anytime that Herb had the summers to himself, bodies would pop up. When they bought Fox Hollow Farm, there was a stop in bodies. The victims identified from the bones discovered at the farm include 20-year-old Johnny Lee Bayer, last seen on May 28th, 1993, on his way to work. 30-year-old Jeff A. Jones, last seen July 31st, 1993, coming out of a Salvation Army Rehab Center. 20-year-old Richard Douglas Hamilton, last seen August 7th, 1993, leaving his apartment. 31-year-old Manuel Resendez, went to a nightclub with friends, but when they were ready to go, he was gone. 26-year-old Stephen S. Hale, he was identified using DNA. 28-year-old Alan Wayne Broussard, who we talked about earlier, last seen on June 6, 1994, leaving a bar that he frequented. And the very first person that we learned about in this story, 33-year-old Roger Allen Goodlett, disappeared on July 22nd. 1994 after a night out at the bar. So it kind of feels like that's the end of the story. You know, unfortunately, old Herb evaded the law, but he did die. It seems that Fox Hollow Farm has a little bit more to say. Rob and Vicki Graves is a couple who eventually purchased the farm. They have reported some strange activities going on around the grounds, specifically seeing maybe the spirits of some of Herb's victims. So of the 11 unique bodies that were discovered on the property, the total is probably double that. In fact, Rob Graves kept finding bones on his property for like 15 years. So with that kind of concentration of dead bodies all in one spot, could it also be haunted? So there's a documentary on YouTube about this called The Haunting of Fox Hollow Farm. You can watch and decide for yourself. There's like reports of doors banging violently without anybody touching them, doors being super hot for no reason at all. And a family friend of the graves said that they saw like a full body apparition of a man in like a full sprint, like running for his life. I mean, what do you think? Do you guys think that the spirits of these people are kind of like stuck there? Maybe they're hanging out, trying to like lead people to find all of the remains so that they can all rest in peace. Let me know in the comments. Well, that, friends, is the story of Herb Baumeister. 
Thank you again to Alma for recommending this story. I really appreciate it. It was also pretty terrible, just the way we like it. If you're interested in any of the makeup that you saw me use today in the story, everything is linked down in the description box. Also linked down there are coupon codes and the link to my merch storefront. I've recently gotten a burst of people asking about merch and stickers and all that stuff. It's all down there. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you wanna see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on all of the socials. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye. Indianapolis. Nope, that's not the name of the state. Wow. Oh my God, there's fallout all over my fucking face. Where were we? Okay, all right, I had to put a fan on, you guys. It's hot. So, if you can hear it, too bad. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Fuck. Hello? Am I in focus? Ah. <laughs>